individuals are treated uh, with respect. Uh, so tonight's session is going to, um, what we did is in advance, we asked um, candidates the, to um, answer the, the one question that uh, is what is, uh, we want you to introduce yourselves, of course, you'll have five minutes and tell, uh, tell us a little bit about yourselves and then one issue that you feel is really important to uh, our community and what you plan to do about it. We're gonna go um, through the candidates in alphabetical order and, uh, and through writings. Uh, so with that, I think we will start with, um, I'd like to start with Burnaby Deer Lake and Ann Kang. Welcome, Ann, I see you on the screen. So, oh, and there's gonna be a timer. Um, so you can watch the timer on your screen. So then you'll know as the five minutes is coming, coming up. Um, and also we have everybody's contact information on the screen so that if your question tonight is not, uh, if we aren't able to get to your question and answer it, you can phone these numbers and talk to your candidates directly. Okay, so Anne, go ahead. I think you're unmuted now, Ann. There you go. Thank you so much. Um, I, there, there's no unmute button. Okay, thank you so much. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ann Kang, and I am proud to be representing Burnaby Deer Lake with John Horrigan and the BC NDP. Um, it is so great to be connecting with the community, with my friends from the Burnaby Neighborhood House um, and with the Burnaby Interagency Council. Um, for those who don't know me, I've been a resident of Burnaby since 1986, and I worked as a teacher in the Burnaby School District. In 2018, I was elected to Burnaby City Council, and I had the honor of serving for three terms. I was elected as MLA for Burnaby Deer Lake in 2017, and in the three and a half years, I've had the privilege of serving in so many different roles. Um, so talking about what we're um, looking for in the community is helping seniors retire with dignity and supportive services that they need is one concern of our community, um, especially working with the seniors at Burnaby Neighborhood House. That's what I've been hearing. In 2017, I was appointed Parliamentary Secretary for Seniors, where my mandate was to promote and, and uh, improve the quality of lives for seniors in British Columbia. And I'm happy to report that uh, we've made significant changes to the 75 care homes that were underfunded. And by 2021, most care homes will have met the standard of care per uh, resident hours day. What BCNEP will do um, is to make new investments of $44 million to hiring 7,000 new healthcare workers in long-term care homes and assisted living. As well, um, in the most recent months during the pandemic, we saw a rise in hate and racism. Um, everyone deserves to live without fear or violence or discrimination. And it is very concerning that we are seeing an increase in racially motivated attacks since the COVID-19 outbreaks. These incidents are completely unacceptable and will not be tolerated. And most recently here in Burnaby, we have seen so many unfortunate incidents. So in my role as Minister Responsible for Multiculturalism, I began the important work of fighting against hate and racism. And BCNDP has made investments to a province-wide network anti-racism program called Resilience BC. Through Resilience BC, we are providing an increased capacity to challenge racism at the community level and ensure our British Columbians are free from discrimination and intimidation. And I also want to especially recognize here uh, the good work of the Burnaby Family Life and their involvement in Resilience BC as one of our 40 community networks. In January of 2020, I had the honor of being appointed to the role of Minister of Citizen Services. And I know that during the pandemic, there is an urgent need to provide information and updates factually and quickly. So my ministry created the 1888 COVID-19 call center in just over a weekend uh, with translation services in 120 languages to fit our, um, the needs of our British Columbians. And I know that a major concern of our community is our healthcare system and the Burnaby Hospital. Hospital. In my last election platform, I promised that I would work my level best to advocate for a new Burnaby Hospital. 
I have worked very hard with all my BCNDP colleagues that you see here, Raj, Janet, Katrina, um, in Burnaby and the Minister of Health and the Burnaby Hospital Foundation for historic $1.3 billion investment. And this $1.3 billion investment project is among the province's largest healthcare investment. And this will include two new towers and a new expanded emergency department. We'll see an additional 400 new beds and a new cancer treatment center. Residents can now look forward to reduced wait times for MRIs and surgeries and emergency rooms. And in my conversations with the members of Burnaby Hospital Foundation, I have heard that they are quite pleased with the quick progress that we have made um, in fulfilling our investment promises to the hospital. And I know firsthand hospital staff wants a new, a larger ER. Um, they want uh, upgraded mental health and additional ward and more patients bed to better serve our increased population. Um, my liberal opponent is also advocating for a new hospital, but on a different site delaying construction and with no concrete solutions. And she likes to talk about the need to invest in a better mental health service. And I'm glad she's agreeing to BC NDP's plan. But in so many ways, she's out of touch and out of sight like she is today with all candidates meet and greet and the Burnaby Board of Trade candidates debate as well. So in my three and a half years, I have worked very tirelessly, um, my utmost, most best and sincerely to advocate for a better quality of life for British Columbians. And um, during COVID-19, I know affordability, housing, health care, child care, education, and eliminating racism are issues important to our communities. And I have worked hard with my BC NDP colleagues to make sure that we have a plan that will get people through the pandemic and ensure that everyone benefits uh, from the economic recovery. So I do look forward to sharing my views on what BC NDP promises to accomplish in uh, the next four years. Thank you so much for inviting me and providing this platform to share um, what we have done and what we will be doing in the next four years. Thank you, Anne. Uh, next, can we hear from uh, Raj Shohan, representing uh, the Burnaby, running in the Burnaby Ed Edmonds um, area. Hi, Raj. Hold on, Raj, because um, you're still muted. We're just working to unmute you. How's that now? There you go. You're unmuted now. Okay. I'll restart. <laughs> uh, thank you, Antonia. Thank you, Burnaby Neighborhood House, for organizing this event so we can uh, speak with uh, the Burnaby Neighborhood members, uh, clients, and our constituents in Burnaby. Um, my name is Raj Chohan. I'm um, uh, the uh, MLA that I was elected since uh, uh, 2005. I have served four terms, 2005, 2009, 2013, and uh, 17. In those uh, years up to seven, uh, 2017, we were in opposition. For 16 years that you know we have waited to get uh, some meaningful investment in Burnaby uh, on all these areas like social, social services, child care, homelessness, senior care, housing. Um, uh, it, all of these areas were neglected. They were not attended to. Uh, every time election came, the BC Liberals promised that they would build a new hospital, but nothing was done. As my colleague and Kang had just said that, you know, when we formed the government, we made it a, as a priority. We were able to secure all four of us together working hard to uh, secure $1.3 billion for a new hospital. We also got urgent primary care centers here. We are also working closely with other healthcare providers to make sure our seniors are taken care of in uh, long-term care uh, places. We are providing more funding uh, that we have never seen before to um, uh, provide more home care so seniors can stay uh, as, uh, as long as possible in their own homes. Uh, to be independent and be taken care of. My background, uh, as before I was elected, uh, all my adult life, I've been working for the rights of workers and seniors. Um, before my election in 2005, I was the head of uh, Hospital Employees Union Bargaining Department. In 2001, just before that election, Gordon Campbell, who was at that time the leader of Liberal uh, Party, came and met with us. He promised 
that they will not uh, um, uh, contract out and privatize uh, healthcare services. But the moment they formed the government, they privatized everything. As a result, 9,000 women, most of the women of color, lost their jobs. They, uh, they were left, uh, many of them became homeless. Uh, that's the legacy the liberals have you know, created here. Then they also uh, dismantled the Human Rights Commission. BC was the only uh, province in Canada had no Human Rights Commission for 16 years. When we formed the government, John Horgan and his government, we made it a priority. Now we have a Human Rights Commission in British Columbia. Uh, we have now a huge challenge of COVID-19, um, as we all know, uh, but what we have seen, we are um, very uh, lucky to have the leadership of uh, John Horgan, Adrian Dix as Minister of Health and Dr. Bonnie Henry to handle this, uh, this challenge that we are facing all, all of us together. The uh, steps taken by the government of um, uh, BC are second to none in, uh, in Canada. We are providing more services to make sure that we control this and get rid of this in the near future, hopefully. Um, I am. Uh, I live in uh, Burnaby. I, you know, I'm. I know the issues faced by uh, the clients and the members of uh, uh, Burnaby Neighborhood House. Unfortunately, my uh, opponent, the Liberal candidate, is not even here, and she lives in Surrey. You know, she doesn't even live here, uh, but. Uh, I'm here to serve you, as I have been doing it since 2005. Affordability is a um, uh, big issue that you know we are working uh, very um, uh, diligently on. That John Horgan government will continue to work to make uh, make uh, our lives more affordable, not just for the top two percent as liberals have been doing. So that's what our goal is. And please uh, check our um, platform. If you have any questions, uh, call us anytime and we will be more than happy to work with you. So I have, I just want to say to, uh, thank you to my constituents uh, for their trust that they have put in me since 2005. I hope they will vote for me again so I will continue to serve them uh, in even a better way. Thank you so much for organizing this. Thank you, Raj. Uh, so next we're going to move to the Burnaby Lowheat area and actually it's the only riding where we have all four candidates here. So thank you for making the time to be with us this evening. We're going to start with uh, Andrew Williamson um, with the Green Party. Uh, just give us a second to um, unmute, unmute you. I'll let you know when you're unmuted. Is that good? You're good, you're ready to go. Hi. Excellent. Thanks, Antonia. Thanks for having me tonight. I'd like to echo the land acknowledgement that you started the call with. I think it's important uh, for myself as a settler in Canada to be reminded that we have an obligation to listen and learn to the cultures and the people that were here before us. Um, I'm a first generation Canadian. I'm a Burnaby resident and I'm also a small business owner in Burnaby. So this conversation tonight and being able to reach um, and take part of this conversation is important to me because I live and work in Burnaby. I have a daughter that goes to Alpha Secondary, so we're very invested in the issues facing the community. And that's what informed my decision to step up and run for the BC Greens in this snap election, um, where we've had a very short campaign to reach as many people as possible. I think the big issue for me is an overarching issue for Burnaby. We have lots of challenges in the city from affordable housing to education, to um, health care and to child care. But I think the layer over top of that is what are we going to do about climate change? That was a big motivator for me to get involved at the provincial level. We know in the Burnaby Low Heat riding that the Trans Mountain Pipeline is under construction. We see the trucks, we sit in the traffic delays, we see the tank farm adjacent to some of our schools on the road out to Forest Grove. We know that just next door in Burnaby North, Parkland Corporation has applied to the province to build more fuel tanks on that site. 
right by Confederation Park and the miniature railway and the inlet, those fuel tanks will have floating roofs. And I think it's beholden on us to have a voice in government that reminds us that we have to live in these communities and that we don't want to keep spending our taxpayer money on technology and an industry that is from the 1950s and is not forward looking. I think if we want to spend taxpayer money, we want to do that as a wise investment. I think being here with my NDP colleagues, I'd like to acknowledge that the minority government that was in Victoria with both NDP and Greens pushed forward a number of the positive measures that you're hearing talked about tonight. And our goal is to continue that collaboration in government and in Victoria between the two parties. And certainly myself and my other BC Green colleagues bring that commitment to say, we will keep the topic of climate change front and center. We will fold it into all discussions that we have in our COVID recovery as a province. And the BC Greens platform, which has been released and you can access on our website, details some of how we tackle that. It's not an easy conversation. It's not a conversation a lot of us want to have. I'm a filmmaker. I just produced a documentary feature where we talk to people around the world about what they're feeling and thinking about the climate change that they're witnessing. We're pretty lucky here in BC and in Burnaby, we're insulated from a lot of the changes that people are seeing around the world. But when you talk to people in the north of Canada, for example, about watching the ice melt and losing parts of their homeland that they have known since they were children, it's an emotional topic. And I think that in Burnaby, we value family and we take care of our children. I think there's more we can do on the early childhood child care education front. But I think a big piece of that is we also want to make sure that they have a similar city to grow up in that we enjoy now to live in. Tr doing the transition away from fossil fuels to a clean tech energy, renewable energy sources, which we have plentiful in the province, that's a key commitment to the Greens. Um, the NDP are still interested in subsidizing the fossil fuel industry. You've heard the statistics, a billion dollars of taxpayers' money last year alone, and plans for that to continue with the LNG plant up in Kitimat at the end of the Douglas Channel. Um, we want to do that differently. We want to take that taxpayer money, invest it in clean tech, renewable resources that are going to provide jobs for British Columbians as part of this transition in the province. Um, I think we're all in it together. I think we've all benefited from a fossil fuel industry and infrastructure, and now it's time to transition out of that. That's definitely what the Greens are involved and committed to. And as I said, I think that affects all British Columbians, but particularly us here in Burnaby, as we're on the front lines of so many of those issues. The Clean, Clean BC plan that you've heard a lot about was worked jointly between the NDP and the BC Greens. Unfortunately, the LNG terminal up in Kitimat will reduce those targets and not make it quite as um, effective a plan as it was going to be. So that's on the table for the Greens to discuss as well. Um, and like I said, I think it comes back to our families. Uh, my parents were very glad of what their sons did as immigrants to this country. They are concerned about their grandparents. I know a lot of people I've talked to during this campaign have shared that concern. They're not quite sure what to do. They know we need to do something. They don't know what that looks like. And I think Sonia Fersenow's leadership with the BC Greens and the platform that we've released lays that out in detail. That's a, a key issue, I think, for Burnaby. I hope those of you listening tonight will consider a vote for the BC Greens as a result. And again, thank you, Antonia, and everybody else who organized. I really appreciate the chance to, to be here and speak tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. So next we have uh, Dominique Painter with the Libertarian Party. Just give us a minute and we're just gonna. Okay, uh, can you hear me? You're good to go. Okay, perfect, thank you so much. All right, hello everyone. My name is Dominique Painter and I am the Libertarian candidate for the Burnaby Rogie riding in the 2020 BC provincial election. Um, I would also just like to take this time to acknowledge that we are currently on the traditional ancestral and unceded lands of the Coast Salish people. 
Um, I would also like to take this time to thank Burnaby Neighborhood House um, for inviting me out to this event tonight and for giving me the opportunity and the Libertarian Party the opportunity to speak to all of the viewers tonight. Um, before I get into anything uh, in terms of our, uh, our biggest issue in Burnaby, I would also like to give a Libertarian Party a small introduction because I feel that many people may not be familiar with the party or what we stand for. So at the current time, um, the British Columbia Libertarian Party was actually founded in 1986, so it's not entirely new. It's been around for a while. Um, it just is not very well known as a, you know, the big three, like the NDP, the Liberals, and the Conservatives. Um, what we stand for is generally individual liberty, uh, limited government, free markets, as well as uh, social tolerance. We believe that every British Columbian has a right to uh, pursue their, their vision um, and their pursuit of a better life. Um, so that's our, our main kind of uh, points for the party. Um, so in terms of the biggest issue that I feel that is facing all of us in Burnaby right now, it would definitely be housing. Um, I moved to Burnaby, uh, like this area in Burnaby, in 2000, and I'm sorry, uh, right at the beginning of this year, at the very beginning of 2020, and I've been renting since then. And, you know, it's almost impossible for me as a young professional to be able to save up enough money at this point to afford a house. Um, I can rent and I can probably rent forever, but it's not going to be possible for me to save up enough um, income based on, on my current position of work and, and how much I get taxed uh, to afford a house. So I think uh, something that we would really like to look at as a party is how we can find more methods of, of working out making housing more affordable and more accessible to everyone that, that does live here. Um, and so one of, or sorry, a few of the solutions that we were looking at doing would be reducing the average tax on, uh, on families and uh, we want to get rid of the regressive taxes that are hurting uh, a lot of low-income working families because that tax takes away any income that they could use towards either saving or, or ch childcare or things of that nature. So that's one thing that we would like to do is just uh, lower the amount of income tax that everyone has to pay. Um, we would also like to release a portion of BC's territory that is currently Crown land because that's land that is essentially not available to the citizens here, belongs to the Crown, the British Crown. Um, and while that is understandable because we are still a part of the British Empire technically, um, I do believe that that land would be better suited for, to use for people that do actually live here um, in this country. So that's another thing that we would like to do. Um, we'd also like to simplify zoning. We would like to make it easier to build uh, small scale multifamily homes in areas that are currently kind of um, inundated by complicated zoning laws and, and things that just make it more complicated and harder for um, housing to be built. And lastly, uh, we would like to do more partnerships with like BC housing and nonprofits and developers um, and other community sources in terms of uh, making more non-market housing available like in terms of pricing. Um, so those are some of the strategies that we would be looking at doing in terms of making housing more accessible and more affordable for people that are living here in Burnaby. Um, and, you know, just looking at the average income of people that live here, it's around $64,000 a year. And the average price of a home, a single detached home, is like around $160 million. So it is, it's unaffordable in a lot of ways for many people. And we just want to make it more accessible for as many people as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Dominique. So next we have uh, Katrina Chen with the NDP. Just give us one second to get you onto the screen, Katrina. There you are. <laughs> Hi. Okay, Hi. You're, you're good to go. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Antonia. And I would also want to begin by recognizing that we are uh, gathering here on the unceded traditional territories of the Coast Salish peoples through Zoom. <laughs> and I just really want to thank uh, Burnaby Neighborhood House and also Burnaby Interagency for bringing us together for this very important conversation. 
I think working with Burnaby nonprofits like Burnaby Neighborhood House has been one of the many reasons why I'm so grateful to have served as a former school trustee and then as MLA during the past three and a half years and also as the Minister of State for Child Care, knowing how well connected and how engaged we are as a community, that every time there is an issue for our local residents, that we have always worked together so uh, collaboratively to be able to respond to the needs of our local community. And this makes me really proud to be a barbarian. And other than being your MLA, I am really a resident who loves this community. I came to Canada alone as a student, but stayed in Burnaby since I graduated from SFU. Burnaby is my home. This is where my son was born and raised and go to school. And I've always worked on the front lines during the past 13 years, and I will always be here for people. And there are so many issues that matters to Burnaby residents, especially Burnaby Lohi residents. But I would say that affordability is definitely one of the top issue and how we need to create an inclusive community where everyone can live, work and learn, especially as we go through this pandemic. But in Burnaby Lohi, uh, many residents are also very concerned about the risks of the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion, especially when it comes to people's safety. That's why I've worked really closely with local residents, City of Burnaby, Burnaby firefighters, and First Nations communities to make sure we protect our environment and our resident safety. But on affordability, during the past few years, you can see that our BCNDP government has invested significantly in healthcare, in childcare, and in education, and also key infrastructures while we invest in good local jobs. Because we know when we invest in people, it's good for our economy. And for this election, we really need to ask who are the best to lead us through this pandemic and during this extraordinary, unprecedented time. And I think the answer is really clear, especially when it comes to affordability that our local residents care the most. That the BCNDP government during the past short and three and a half years, we have been investing in people and the services that they count on. And during the past few months, people have seen how fast we react to this pandemic and making sure that we can go through this together. And a few examples are when the BC Liberals ignored the child care crisis for years and years. As a Minister of State for Child Care, I am so honored to have the opportunity and as a mom who once struggled with child care, that we have been working hard to build a foundation to bring an inclusive, affordable, quality early learning and care system for all families. And in BC, we have supported the creation of over 20,000 spaces. And right here in Burnaby, we have over uh, about a thousand new spaces that are coming to Burnaby. Most of them are on school grounds and actually already being built <laughs> and serving local families. We're bringing down the cost of child care and we also need to support support the work of early childhood educators. And currently, there are about 33,000 families paying $10 a day or less, with a lot more families who are getting a fee reduction. And we will continue to expand that work. Because when parents can go back to work, when we invest in childcare, that's really good for our economy. And the BC, when the BC Liberals got rid of, for example, 10,000 healthcare workers and failed to invest in healthcare, we are investing in Burnaby's primary care network. We're investing in Burnaby seniors, including 4 million dollar to enhance the quality of services in Burnaby senior care homes and we are redeveloping the new Burnaby hospital and there's so much work we have to do together as we go through this pandemic when it comes to health care and when the BC levels allow speculation and housing costs to go out of control we are investing in housing and with the help of local organizations like the neighborhood house the new mayor and council and the community together we have brought hundreds of affordable housing units to Burnaby just during the past few years and we will continue to do more the NDP also got rid of the unfair MSP, the tolls, and we also cut 20% of small business tax. And we are going to provide free transit for children up to the age of 12. Again, making life more affordable for British Columbians and Burnaby residents. And in my writing, as we continue to invest in healthcare to go through this pandemic, I'm excited to hear about the new medical school that's going to SFU. And I'm also proud to say that we're investing in bringing new jobs, including moving an innovative medical research company to bring about three to 4,000 jobs right near Burnaby Mountain. And we're also supporting local high tech companies to bring a better clean energy future. And in the community, as many of you know, I've worked really hard to address every resident's issues, concerns, working with many local organizations like the Neighborhood House and volunteered at local food banks and deliveries during the pandemic. Whenever I have time and not sitting in the legislature working on policies and issues, I'm spending the vast majority of my time working in a community with people. And in closing, I just really want to thank you all for the opportunity and for your trust during the past many years. My pledge is simple. I've always been here for you for the past 13 years, and I will always be here for Burnaby families. Thank you, Katrina. You, you have seven seconds left. So next, um, we have uh, Tariq Malik. Did I say that properly? From the Liberal um, 
the Liberal Party. Please correct my pronunciation if I said it. Just give us a minute. We're getting you onto the screen. Tariq, are you there? There you are. Hi, welcome. Just a minute, we're just unmuting you. Oh, Trick, apparently you need to press your unmute button on your computer there. How's that? Can you hear me? Perfect. Now we can hear you. I have my technical team to my right over here. No worries. Okay, good evening. Thank you so much. Uh, it's an honor to be here and uh, listening to all this discussion. Uh, a little bit about me. I came to Canada about 32 years ago with my parents from Bangladesh with a vision to have a better life. I started working with agriculture and poultry firms. I made my work to university uh, while working at Panago. I worked my way up until I owned two Panagos of myself. As my business grew, I was able to venture into real estate and construction. I have been married to the biggest supporter of my life, Afsana, for 21 years, and we have four children, and they attend elementary, high school, and university. I have also served on several nonprofit boards, including the president of Bangladeshi Cultural Association. Over the years of my presidency, I had the pleasure and meeting and knowing many political leaders, and many of you are present here at this moment. One thing I have learned over the years is how important it is to connect with your constituents. I have door knocked over 8,000 homes nonstop in past 17 days. I also reached out to my friends who have been in politics for a long time. And they all advised me one thing that Tariq, you will need to work much harder than probably your opponent and do not take this for granted. I'm fortunate to have over 200 volunteers who have been my driving force, the best campaign managers, Jenny and Mark, and my riding president, Randy, and the entire team. As an immigrant to this country, I have worked hard all my life, and I genuinely believe that it is the only way we can prosper. So to all the young men and women, I humbly request you always invest your 100% effort, and it doesn't matter what you do, but do it passionately and sincerely. I would be honored to be your MLA for Barney Lohit. I have deep roots in the community and look forward to continuing investing in it. The economics engine is small business and we need to keep it strong and viable to better provide for children, seniors, and families. Under Andrew Wilkinson, I look forward to bringing in a PST cut that will kick start the economy and NDP majority government and will bring us endless deficits, debt, and taxes. We need to grow the private sector, not government bureaucracy. As an active community member, I'm always ready to roll up my sleeves to help. I firmly believe we need to hold hands and stand shoulder to shoulder, regardless of our place of origin, color of our skin, or your religious belief. We have a lot of challenges ahead of us, and we need to work together. The best compliment I received yesterday was when an 84 years old gentleman opened the door while I was door knocking, and he said, Tariq, I read about you. Now that I have spoken with you, I have no doubt that you are a true Canadian and thank you for standing up for our community. My commitment to you is to work tirelessly and bring Barnaby to Victoria to have your voice heard. I humbly ask you for your support so we can have a strong voice for Barnaby Lloyd. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tariq. So next we're gonna move to the Burnaby North uh, riding. And uh, we have Janet Rutledge. Um, just give us a minute, uh, Janet, to get you onto the screen and unmuted. There you are. Hi, welcome. 
Thanks, Antonia. And uh, thank you to the Burnaby North, uh, Burnaby um, uh, Neighborhood House uh, and Interagency for organizing this. I too would like to acknowledge uh, that uh, I am speaking to you uh, from the traditional unceded territory of the Hukamayman and Squamish speaking people. And I say that not, not just because it's become accepted uh, protocol, uh, but because I want to remind myself uh, that uh, my people were uh, uh, relative uh, latecomers to this land, and uh, I will forever appreciate that. Um, I am running for re-election in uh, Burnaby North, and I'd like to tell you why. Uh, I've spent a lifetime organizing people to stand up for themselves, their families, and each other. And I learned early that governments play an enormous role in determining who has power in our society and how they get to use it. The BC Liberals used their 16 years in office to concentrate power at the top in the hands of those who already had it. And they made deep cuts to, to the taxes of the wealthy. They paid for those cuts by eliminating services people relied on. And they shifted the tax burden to those who could least afford it by doubling MSP premiums, uh, tripling tuition fees, for example. And they changed laws to make it harder for the average British Columbian to protect themselves. And for 16 years, they put profits before people. And for 16 years, they hung on to power in Burnaby North, where I live. I decided to seek election because I wanted to share power. I'm honored that the people of Burnaby uh, North have put their trust in me in 2017. And ever since, I've worked hard to live up to that trust. Democracy is not a spectator sport. And since being elected, I have taken initiative to bring people out of the bleachers and onto the playing field. Every day I wasn't in Victoria, I engaged with constituents. I even continued to knock on doors between sittings of the legislature so I could have direct conversations with voters and listen to their concerns. And after COVID, I continued to connect with voters. I had a team of volunteers who phoned voters to check in with them on my behalf to make sure they felt safe and knew uh, what supports were available to them. I'm proud of the fact uh, that it is acknowledged outside of BC that our COVID response is seen as the most effective in North America. That's largely because as a government, we let the medical experts take the lead. We follow Dr. Henry's directions and put in place financial supports so people and businesses could feel secure to do the right thing to keep us all safe. During the last election, I kept hearing from voters that they were struggling to keep their heads above water. Some couldn't find childcare, so they couldn't go back to work. Some talked about the childcare being so expensive. One woman told me that after she paid for childcare out of her paycheck, she had $35 left. Some told me that their rent was so high, they had to move out of Burnaby North. And a lot of voters talked about the anxiety of not having a family physician. Uh, we made it a priority to find solutions to those challenges. Now, my other colleagues in the, the BC NDP have already spoken about initiatives we've taken in childcare and in housing. And I'd like to talk about uh, healthcare and one initiative in particular in healthcare. I want to talk about the Burnaby Primary Care Network. It is a prototype community-based model, and we should be bragging about it more. The network is jointly run by doctors, Fraser Health, and front, frontline community organizations. And it really found its feet during uh, when the pandemic broke out. And it established working groups to address some of the most immediate needs of our neighbors. It, um, uh, it identified seniors uh, that were isolated uh, alone and needed someone to get them groceries and prescriptions. It helped to find safe shelter for the homeless in Burnaby. And it is no coincidence that there are no tent cities in Burnaby. Uh, and making uh, sure that frontline workers had childcare. And because they are a network, they were able to pivot to new priorities and mobilize um, massive numbers of volunteers. And now doctors are more connected to the resources in the community than their, that their patients might need. These are all local initiatives that are changing people's lives for the better, and they are all BC NDP initiatives. And we've only had three and a half years to get them up and running. Not bad for a minority government. And yes, it was made possible because we had the support of the Green Party on most of what we needed to do. 
but not on everything. And the BC Liberals will want you to believe that they will pilot us through the pandemic and economic recovery better and faster, but they won't. All we need to do is look at long-term care. It has been the hardest hit by the pandemic because the Liberals turned them into profit havens for their rich friends. Now I see I'm quickly running out of time here. Um, so I um, will just want to, uh, I hope that I get a chance to answer some questions and I wanna thank you for this opportunity and I look forward to the questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Janet. And there will be questions after um, the next two uh, candidates um, speak. We collected questions via email. Um, okay, the next we have Noreen Shim with the Green Party who is um, gonna speak to you. Welcome, Noreen. Hi there, thank you so much for having me this evening. I'm so grateful to be here. Um, my name is Noreen and I am the BC Greens MLA candidate for Burnaby North. And I today am a 36 year old minority small business owner here in Burnaby and I see through many lenses. For me, affordable housing isn't just a problem to be solved, it's also my reality. Mental health issues aren't just buzzwords. Um, climate change isn't some far off distant future, it's influencing my decisions today. Having grown up in the Lower Mainland, I always knew owning a home might be out of reach, but now we're faced with even renting being out of reach. I personally have chosen not to start a family because I fear that I won't be able to afford a two bedroom rental. I fear that I won't be able to buy my own home. Um, and Just a minute, Noreen, you just got muted. Just hold on a second. Okay, you're unmuted. Sorry about that. That's okay. Um, uh, as a professional working as the executive assistant to the chief financial officer for the city of Vancouver, I didn't know if I would be able to afford a place to live. My partner, Aaron, he's a special education assistant working with high school students who have special needs or behavioral issues. We deeply understand the needs of our community here in Burnaby. We experience the reality of so many other young people. We are left with this decision, move away from our homes, our communities, our families to somewhere more affordable, or we stay and try to find a way to make things better. Well, I'm staying and I'm committed to making things better. So many factors contribute to our affordable housing crisis, out of state real estate, uh, out of control real estate prices, scarcity of supply, run evictions, illegal B and Airbnb hotels, a lack of supportive housing, and so many more. If elected to be your MLA, I will work to ensure affordable housing for all. I will do this by expanding speculation tax, vacancy tax, and the foreign buyers tax, in addition to closing the loopholes in the speculation tax that allows many, many foreign owners still um, to be exempt. I will increase supply by building more supportive housing communities, um, including cooperative housing developments, and the affordable missing middle um, non-condo housing units. Um, I would include increase the fines for illegal Airbnb hotels and implement different models of short and long-term supportive housing. The BC Greens see that the affordable housing crisis is more than just too few houses. We see the systemic issues that have led us here and we're uh, prepared to address them. In addition to streamlining development applications and approvals, expanding co-op housing and fast tracking the development of um, and construction of these missing middle houses, um, we simply would like to see something other than condos or single family homes as options for our young people. By taking this housing first approach, we can accelerate investments to affordable, supportive and 
social housing on a priority basis. Also, um, we've committed to introducing a rental supplement that will close the gap between affordable rent and what people are actually paying, which in most cases is much, much more than 30% of their income. Um, here in Burnaby, with a pipeline running right through our backyard, we are literally as close to the effects of climate ne negligence as one can get. As your MLA, I will work to ensure that all legislation going forwards protects our communities and our families from the effects of climate change. Let's work together towards a greener future. Let's ensure the youth of today have a planet and a home for tomorrow. I stand for justice equality for all, a sustainable future, uh, both environmentally and economically. As a tech savvy and socially conscious millennial, I can be a bridge between my parents' generation that came before me and Generation Z that comes after me. It's time for voices like mine to join the conversation, voices that represent greater diversity and a fresh perspective. I hope that after getting to know me, I will have earned your vote in this election, and I very much look forward to leading you all into a greener future. Thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you very much to Burnaby Neighborhood House for hosting, and thank you all of you for being engaged enough to join us here tonight, because without supporters like you, democracy simply doesn't exist. So please, whomever you're voting for, go out, do it and encourage your friends to do the same. Thank you so much. Thank you, Noreen. That's an important message. Everybody should go out and vote. Uh, next, uh, last but not least, we have Raymond Dong with the Liberal Party running in Burnaby North. And then once Raymond is done, we um, I have questions that I will be um, directing to um, the candidates. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Thank you, Antonia. I want to begin by uh, thanking the um, Burnaby Neighborhood House North uh, Division and the Interagency Council for the opportunity to speak to you. Um, I'm also going to give you my five W's as a way of introduction. So who am I? I'm a first generation Chinese um, physician, uh, born in Vancouver, raised in uh, what we now call Old Chinatown at the corner of Gordon Hastings. I spent my first 20 years there. It's now become the downtown east side, but it wasn't when I was young. We could have summer days playing softball at Oppenheimer Park and it was safe. We didn't have tent cities and we didn't have the uh, myriad of issues that plague that uh, part of town uh, now that weren't there when I was growing up. I spent the next uh, 10 years of my uh, adult life in Vancouver's East End. I'm the father of two children. I've been a heart specialist since 1988, having trained at UBC and the University of Toronto. When I came back full of uh, vim and vigor and fire to start my practice, it was noteworthy that the major hospital, which used to be called the Chauncey Hospital, was closed by an NDP government all for the sake of a five-year health accord. I had friends who were technicians and nursing staff who were basically seconded and had their wages paid for two years without having done a single day's work because of a duty to accommodate. More on that later. I've been at Surrey Hospital since 1999 and I've had medical leadership roles for the last 12 years. I am the current president of the Medical Staff Association and look after the well being and the wellness of 650 doctors at the Surrey Hospital complex. Where have I been all these years other than practicing cardiology? Well, I've been involved with many community organizations, including Diabetes Canada, the Heart and Stroke Foundation. I've served on the advisory council for the Diabetes Chinese Education Group. I've worked tirelessly with success. I've promoted health in multi-languages. I speak Cantonese and some Mandarin. Because of where I work, I'm also deeply involved with the South Asian Health Initiative, the Canada India Network Society, and, and currently the board chair of the Vancouver Academy of Music, which fuels my love for the performing arts. The when and why? Well, I'm interested in preventive health, 
for populations as a whole. I believe that healthy populations make for healthy communities. I have a special interest in congestive heart failure. My most recent uh, adventures have been in quality improvement and how to improve what we do in healthcare uh, generally. I educate at all levels, including allied health, nurses, medical students, high school students, all the way up to postgraduate uh, professorial candidates. I, I teach them all. I am a strong supporter of the performing arts and I believe in uh, diversity and cultural activities uh, across the province. Why am I doing this? You understand And after 30 years of being a, a heart specialist, you wonder why am I doing this? It's because I, I was challenged by the cynical disdain which the premier demonstrated when he abandoned this province for the sake of um, uh, a naked power grab in the face of a pandemic. We are now fully in second wave, you all know that. My value system include respect for the dignity of the individual, equality for all, including fairness with honor. I believe in the freedom of action and speech while at the same time obeying the rule of law. I believe in the integrity of character, truthfulness, being trustworthy, honest, and upright with the citizens of Burnaby North. And I believe in responsibility. We should be accountable with the moral obligation to help others and to contribute to society. That's been my mantra all of my life. We were asked to talk about one main issue. There are many issues which um, involve Burnaby North as it does many other communities in the province. My main issue in this community is health. Everyone needs it. Nothing happens without good health and access to quality health care. As a medical specialist, I've been in practice for over three decades. This year is like any, unlike any other, the pandemic has turned our world upside down and communication has allowed us to be quick and nimble. It's hard for me to imagine that the government can take claim for all the things that have happened in healthcare. You, the people have been responsible for bending the curve, not the government. My mother spent her last days in palliative care at Burnaby North I mean, Burnaby Hospital, so I'm intimately familiar with that hospital. It needs a new hospital, it's deplorable as it is aging, and people need better access to mental health and addictions treatment. And this will have an impact on many other areas such as homelessness, affordability, and will reduce the formation of permanent tent cities. If elected, I promise you to not only move to the riding, but also work on your behalf to ensure that the new hospital is built. Thank you. Thank you, Raymond. So now we're going to move to questions that um, we collected via email from people that registered for tonight's um, session. And uh, I have, uh, I will uh, ask the candidates to, by name, to um, answer the particular question. The first one uh, is. Antonio, I didn't hear your question because you, know, you are muted. You still are muted. Okay, I have my technical uh, <laughs> assistant here. Thank goodness. <laughs> okay, sorry, the question was, um, Uh, don't you think all constituents have enough to deal with at the moment with the pandemic? Why did the NDP break their agreement with the Green Party uh, to call an early election now? That's okay, I'm, I'm very happy to answer that question. Thank you uh, for the question, whoever has asked. Um, we did not break any um, contract with anybody. Um, what we have done we have listened to the science and instruction from um, uh, Dr. Bonnie Henry. We have seen the COVID-19 pandemic is not finishing, uh, ending now, it's just the beginning. So we thought 
we need a stable government, uh, get a stable government before it becomes really uh, out of control or it could be out of control like what we have seen in Ontario or Quebec or in the United States. Hopefully we won't get there, but what we can do is we will continue to work hard as we have done until now under the direction from Dr. Bonnie Henry, Premier John Horgan, our Minister of Health, Adrian Dick. They have done a phenomenal job to control a pandemic here in British Columbia. So we need a steady hand. We need a proven leadership to continue uh, on that, um, um, in that direction. So that's why, you know, we are here. Election was called, you know, um, People will just say whatever they want to say. That's their right to say. The reality is COVID-19 is not leaving us, you know, as we hope that it'll do it soon. It's there. And so we need to continue with really uh, uh, strong leadership, a proven leadership to make sure that we it's under control. Thank you, Raj. So the next question, I'm gonna um, pose the question and then I will um, let each candidate from um, each party an answer it, but I've, so I've chosen um, just randomly Anne Kang with the NDP and Noreen, um, I think you're the only green left on here and then Tariq Malik with the Liberal Party. So the question is, it's, it has to do with doctor shortage and it says, do you support the new medical school? I, Okay, I, th I thought I was muted, sorry. Um, do you support the new medical school being at SFU Surrey campus or at the Burnaby campus? What steps will you take to help ensure that doctors trained at the new school stay in BC and particularly in Burnaby? So uh, Tariq Malik, can you go first, please? Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. That's great. <laughs> that's a that's a really great question. Um, I think it was about the time that we have, you know, we should open up a medical faculty at SFU. Um, I do remember, you know, I was a medical student and I wrote my MCAT over a long time ago. And because of the shortage at UBC, I couldn't get in. So um, I'm so happy to see that they have, you know, the, taken that approach and opening up that campus at SFU. Um, this will tremendously help our our generations to come. And, um, and you know, how we know at UBC probably have 180 students. Hopefully we can double that. And, um, you know, we have all the shortage of doctors. Uh, I have a lot of uh, friends that are in this medical field. And we always talk about, you know, how our medical care system can be improved. We also see a big influx of doctors coming from you know international uh, uh, and other countries and uh, it is um, i'm happy to see that, that the government has taken the right approach and opening up um, that that door for you know for our next generations to to come forward and uh, contribute to our community and um, i i truly think that um, you know sfu campus the barnaby campus would be an ideal uh, movement because uh, i think uh, we have the enough infrastructures. I did have an opportunity to talk to SFU um, faculties uh, not too long ago, but I believe about last week. And uh, we did discuss about that, the, the shortage of um, the, the buildings and also the, some of the buildings are really old and we really need to upgrade our infrastructures. So my, my uh, pledge to you and uh, if I am elected um, MLA, I will work hard uh, to make this thing happen and uh, to better serve our community. And that's my take on this. I think we can do it. Thank you. Thank you. So next we have uh, Noreen. Can you answer that question, please? Hi, thank you. Uh, yeah, so the doctor shortage is obviously something that um, is really urgent for us because I myself am currently without a family doctor because there simply isn't one taking any clients. And it's been that way for the nearly five years that I've lived here in Burnaby North. That is a problem. But one of the issues that often doesn't get talked about is the fact that there are fewer and fewer doctors that are going into family medicine. 
the reason they're not going into family medicine is because the the stipulations around they're doing um, doing rounds at the hospitals, um, the amount of patients that they need to take uh, in order for their clinics to be profitable. These types of issues are systemic issues. And yes, opening up a new medical school is extremely important, especially here in Burnaby. We want to have those students um, be, be uh, peripheral business that comes along with that. Um, but we also need to address the fact that our medical system needs to promote uh, better family doctors, more of them. And we want to start we want to start inspiring our young doctors to go into family medicine because the way the system is is structured at the moment, many are choosing not to go into family medicine because the hours are so long and the money for them is simply not there unless they give a substandard um, uh, substandard level of care. And in my eyes, that is wrong. We should not have to be making those decisions, not here in BC, not in Canada. We have the funds, we have the infrastructure, we should be doing better for our communities and especially our smaller communities in remote areas who oftentimes will not have um, even one doctor within, um, within driving range. We cannot continue to expect people to fly to see their family doctors. So yes, I agree that this is a problem and I will work diligently to ensure that it is one that we work to, towards solving. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anne, you can go next. Thank you. Um, definitely, this is uh, doctor shortage is one of the uh, problems that we have dealt with, um, really struggled with uh, for, for such a long time. And I do really want to emphasize that um, it was due to BC Liberal underfunding for 16 years of our hospital facilities or infrastructure, but um, of course, uh, not respecting the amount of spaces that we need to create to make sure that we have doctors uh, train uh, here in British Columbia so that we can retain people in staying here. And in this retention, we also have to remember that there's so many levels and it's, it's a complex one. Uh, number one, we need to have tuition fees that are uh, affordable for students. We need to be able to um, give um, tax, uh, sorry, uh, interest-free tuition fees, which BC and DP has done as well. Um, if we don't build hospitals, if we don't have extra or new beds, uh, where are these uh, doctors going to be servicing. So NDP has invested this holistically and has put this in a perspective that will be working for British Columbians. So we have been investing millions and millions of dollars in um, building 13 new, new or improved hospitals around British Columbia. And as we could see here in uh, uh, Burnaby, we have a $1.3 billion investment with 40 new beds and um, expanded uh, uh, emergency room and uh, up upgraded and expanded mental health and addiction ward. We've expanded maternity uh, ward. We, we have two new extra towers to make sure that we could take care of our citizens here and also a cancer care center. So just imagine how we are um, attracting uh, doctors to stay in Burnaby and come in Burnaby because we are creating jobs, but not on only are we creating jobs, we are providing the care that Burnaby residences need here. Um, the, the past 16 years when liberals were in government, they refused to build or replace hospitals and that is where the um, underfunding, the lack of um, the attraction for, for doctors to be working because um, not everyone's going to be an entrepreneur, not everyone's going to be able to open up their clinic um, by themselves, but um, to be part of a public system is something that's really precious. and. Um, we are also going to be investing in $1.6 billion more to healthcare system to hire 7,000 more staff to fight COVID-19. So I'm pretty sure we will be able to advocate and I will be advocating with my colleagues here, Katrina, uh, Raj and Janet, we'll be working very hard as a team because part of this is team-based care. And I know team-based care are trying their best to attract new and young doctors as well. We will be working with a First Nation a Health Authority to make sure that these doctors are also um, taking care of our First Nations in remote uh, rural and Indigenous areas. So this is not just one lens, 
in, in how to retain and where to put doctors, but also creating spaces, creating facilities, because we know there are needs and we want to be reducing wait times in our healthcare system. So this is BCNDP's plan to make sure to attract, retain, but also to train. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. So the next, uh, the next question, um, I'm gonna, it has to do with the Burnaby Hospital and um, we'll have, uh, I would like um, Janet from NDP to answer and Raymond Dong from Liberal, Noreen, you get to talk again with the um, Green and Dominique um, Painter, Libertarian. So the question is, um, the hospital opened on October 30th, 1952. Hmm, that's before I was born, almost 68 years ago. Uh, do you support the current redevelopment plan or are you in favor of a new hospital facility? What work will you do and what guarantees will you provide to ensure that the hospital is built on time and on budget? So Janet, do you want, can you go first? Uh, yes, I'm happy to go first. Um, I am thrilled that we are finally um, getting around to redeveloping the Burnaby Hospital. Um, I also am very attached to that hospital. Um, my, um, I've been in that hospital. Um, my mother uh, died in that hospital. Uh, my granddaughter uh, spent three months in, um, in uh, the uh, NICU uh, when she was born prematurely. We are, it, it has been a big part of our lives. And I um, am thrilled uh, that it's going to be redeveloped. Now, I know that it has been a political football about should we redevelop it? Uh, should we tear it down and build something somewhere else? Um, I think that the we looked at this option. Uh, we sat down with the uh, then Minister of Health. He showed us the different options. And it made sense to go uh, with redevelopment. It will be a new hospital. It will have new cutting edge um, uh, features to it, but what it won't be will be um, caught up in a huge redevelopment land sale because that's also part of a, of a decision about building a hospital, is, a new hospital is where do you put it? And then it becomes about the profitability of land, the profitability of the land that it sits on now, and the profitability of the land we would have to purchase in order to build a new hospital. Uh, we crunched the numbers. Um, it will, it will, won't take nearly as long to have this hospital in its current place up and running, and it won't cost nearly as much. And the people of Burnaby and the other cat parts of the catchment area deserve a new state of the hospital, uh, state of the arts hospital now, not a long time in the future. And it, we are ready to go. There will be shovels in the ground next year. Thank you. Uh, so next, can we have Raymond uh, from Liberal Party respond to that question? Thank you. Yes, hello. Thank you for that question. There is no doubt that Burnaby needs a hospital. Call it what you will, new or redevelopment. The important thing is to make sure that it is on time and on budget. I have seen the plans. It's important to note that this was announced in 2016 by the Liberal government with then Minister of Health, Terry Lake. I was there at that announcement when he was in the grounds of the Burnaby Hospital and announced this plan. It's been three and a half years and the NDP have not moved on it. I have many colleagues and friends who work at that hospital. I know that hospital intimately because of my mother's illness. My brother is a respirologist in Burnaby and he works through that hospital and he's quite well known in, in the city. And so I'm all for a structure. The important thing is how to safely safeguard the transition from new to old without 
compromising patient care. And I think that that has to be still to be worked out. I've seen beyond the concept plan. I'm not sure I believe the comment about troubles in the ground. For example, when you look at the Surrey new hospital, yes, they have a piece of land because that's already government owned land, but there is zero dollars on the line item budget in the current budget for what is supposed to be a half a billion dollar uh, new structure. So I can't believe for a minute that this government is going to carry through in its promises. They have so many mega projects on the go. I am concerned that Burnaby will not be on top of the queue, despite the promises. I have yet to see the shovel in the ground. I have yet to see the tendering process go beyond tendering. So I'm, uh, if elected, I will certainly be on the front line of this particular issue, uh, moving it forward as quickly as possible. I know the players, I know the stakeholders, I know what's needed. And I believe that my expertise in after 30 years of delivering healthcare will help me in uh, making this uh, a reality. Thank you. Thank you. Noreen, did you want to answer that question? Hi, I would, thank you. I actually agree with Janet on this one. Um, I support a redevelopment plan as well. The redevelopment, instead of moving it to a new location, cuts out a large portion of the work. Um, acquisitions is actually one of the most difficult and expensive parts of the process because you have to do land assessments on each one, and these land assessments can take months. Um, so. I actually think that redeveloping would bring us this new hospital that is so desperately needed faster um, and cheaper. So I used to work in commercial real estate development. I um, used to work in acquisitions and development, in fact. Um, I've worked on many large scale development projects such as the multi-million dollar developments at the shops at New West and Zemiamu. Um, I worked on the $14 million purchase of Falls Creek Village in 2012. I know how to keep projects on budget and on time. And I will not allow for our community to continue to be served by an inadequate hospital for any longer than is necessary. I will ensure that these projects are not just moving forwards, but moving forwards in a timely manner and also respecting the budgets um, that have been set for that project. Um, uh, yeah, thank you very much, that's all. Thank you. And um, last, could we have Dominique speak to that question? Hi there. Okay, um, so in terms of this question, uh, due to the fact that I'm relatively new to this area, I don't feel that I have enough uh, statistical knowledge to kind of have a very well informed opinion on the issue. However, based on the brief research that I've been able to do, um, I do think it would make sense to keep the existing infrastructure that is there, uh, just due to the fact that during the COVID pandemic, there's been a lot of um, extraneous budget spending. And I don't think it would make sense to start developing a completely new facility um, just because that's going to put a, a larger strain on the budget that's already been you know, quite quite spread out thinly. Um, as for the Libertarian Party, I believe that if we were to obtain a seat in the legislature, we won't really have the ability to influence um, a, a project of this magnitude because we just won't have uh, the manpower necessary to tackle it. So we wouldn't necessarily be able to guarantee anything um, by ourselves. It would have to be in collaboration with one of the other major parties. Um, in my personal opinion, though, I do think it makes sense to use what we have in place now um, and in the future when construction can proceed in an unhampered manner, when you know, construction companies are able to function fully without the COVID restrictions, um, then we can go ahead with, uh, with a full speed attempt at building a new facility. That would be my answer. Thank you. Um, so I just looked at the time. It's Boy, time's going fast. It's like 17 minutes after seven. So um, 
the next question, and um, we will let um, uh, Noreen from the Green Party answer, Raymond, Liberal, and Katrina from NDP. And the question is, how do you plan to work with all levels of government on housing? This includes not only housing for those people who are unhoused, but a appropriateness of housing that integrates well into neighborhoods. It cannot be towers around sky trains. This is too dense and inappropriate while areas of single family homes are untouched. Uh, so Noreen, do you wanna answer that first? I would love to answer this one first. This one is my um, this one is my pet project. So, I believe that the reason we have housing, um, unaffordable housing, is because we have, um, like I was talking about earlier, a lack of missing middle homes. So that means any homes that are not condos or single family homes. We're talking duplexes, town homes, row homes, laneway homes, um, the type of homes that people like me, young middle-class owners would be able to afford. In addition, we have a lot of pressure on our rental stock because of the fact that home ownership is so far out of reach. Until we cool the market at the higher levels, we are never going to see any changes in the prices um, further downstream. In addition to that, there is a large component um, that isn't being addressed in our in many of our housing plans, and that's the lack of mental health institutions within our province. One of the large issues is that there are no um, emergency, short-term or long-term fully dedicated facilities that are accessible to all people within the province. We need to do better for our most marginalized people, for the people who either are not able to take care of themselves or have medical issues that prevent them from, from being able to, to be safely, um, to have housing security. We need to ensure that we are taking care of those people and not just letting them languish on the streets. We need to ensure that they have places to go at night, supportive homes um, and addictions facilities that are available not six months later, but available today when they need them, when they want them. Um, I will also ensure that working with um, the city council, Joe Keithley is, um, a civic green and he actually just endorsed me today. We have been working very closely as um, I have a background in um, urban planning and our official community plans are well out of date. And like the question, like the person who asked the question had been saying, we can't just keep building towers next to SkyTrain stations. This isn't the Burnaby that we want. This is not how I want to raise my family in Burnaby. I don't want to be stuck in a condo. Um, so it's really important that we not only modernize our official community plan to ensure that we're addressing those zoning issues, but that we're also making sure that Housing BC, which is the, uh, sorry, BC Housing, which is the provincial entity that controls the funding that gets trickled down to um, our communities is held accountable because the last, um, in the last um, round of promised funding, Burnaby only received $20,000, 20,000. That is an astonishing number for the amount of people who are facing housing insecurity in Burnaby today. So I do hope that you'll join me in both working with city council to address these systemic issues and also holding uh, BC Housing accountable to ensuring that they're managing those funds appropriately. Thank you. Answer that question, but can we just, um, I need to time, I think we need to um, give a, a certain time. So how about two minutes to answer that question, Raymond? 
Can you put the time clock on? Sure. Can you hear me now? Get the clock going. Okay. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Um, thank you. That's a, a terrific question. I believe that the question is, how best to integrate all levels of government that are involved with housing. Housing is not just a local issue where it's the right person in the right place at the right time, but it's also a provincial and national issue. So we have to leverage any funding from the federal government for infrastructure. We have to leverage BC Housing and I agree with Noreen to hold them accountable. We're gonna be needs a new future forward looking community plan. We need to sit down with uh, urban, um, planners and look at zoning and rezoning and changing the zoning schema. We also need to look at incentivizing the uh, development and construction of affordable housing in whatever it fits. I believe also that density in its simplest form is not the only answer. It is part of the answer, but I think integrating all levels of government, everybody at the table is the way to go. We need to leverage every part of fund that are available to assist in this. One level of government cannot do it alone. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, so Katrina, next, two minutes. Thank you so much. And I do think it's very important to address the diverse needs of our population for housing. And I actually have to point out, I disagree with what the Green candidate has said. It should not be anyone's pet project. Housing is the basic human rights that we have. Without the roof over your head, how can we be able to go to work, be able to contribute to our community and our economy or go to school? It should not be a pet project. It has to be everyone's basic right. And that's what the BC NDP government has been working hard with the federal government, with municipal government on many initiatives to make sure we can address the housing crisis that was left by the BC Liberal government for many, many years when they encouraged speculation when housing costs went out of our control. And that even fueled into our money laundering problem and issues with crime. There's so much we have done during the past three, uh, three and a half years, including our 30 point housing plan that ended speculation, that prevents uh, speculation issues, that has freed up about 11,000 rental housing units across BC communities, including the student housing investment in Burnaby Lohi at SFU. That has also helped to address the needs of local rental market. We have built uh, 3,800 supportive housing units in 30 communities, including the modular housing right here in Burnaby. That's the first time ever that we have provided this wraparound support type of housing uh, that's connected to mental health and homelessness uh, needs to ensure that people can have a roof over their head as they continue to transition to permanent housing. We need to continue to work and also look at the diverse needs of housing in our BC communities, including co-op housing. That is uh, a vast, you know, in my writing, actually, we have the largest co-op housing stock in the lower mainland that we need to look for a creative way to support them to create more. And I've already have a few projects that's in the work that will hopefully create more housing opportunities, including there is a project that's in Burnaby North um, that is done by a nonprofit success with affordable housing units, senior and childcare added into it. And we have to do more to support housing and to support people in our community. And when the BC Liberal ignored the crisis for many, many years, we're making housing more affordable for people in British Columbia. Thank you, Katrina. Okay, so I think we have time for one last question and well, It'll be like one minute each, but here's the question. And the speakers, if I could have um, Dominique with the Libertarian, Raj, NDP, Noreen, you get to speak a lot because you're the only green uh, candidate left here, and Tariq with the Liberal Party. The question is, what, what are your party's plans on climate change and the Site C project and the LNG? One minute, sorry. Let's hear from Dominique first. Hi, sorry about that. Um, so as of right now, our policy is still currently um, in flux at the moment. We're still developing essentially how we would like to deal with that, all of those issues. Um, it is hard for me to give you a, a stable opinion on that one, just because I know that it may change and I don't wanna misrepresent um, 
our platform. So what I would say is that you can definitely check out our website at libertarian.bc.ca um, and we should have a more complete answer essentially by the end of this week. Um, but I just don't feel comfortable giving a, an answer on that right now because I don't want to uh, be misquoted in the future. Sorry about that. No. Uh, yeah. uh, can we hear from uh, Raj on that question? Okay. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Well, um, first of all, Site C was not our calling. You know, it was the liberals. They started Christy Clark, pushed it to the point of no return. And when we saw billions of dollars invested in, in that uh, um, uh, project, uh, we had to continue. But what we have done, we have developed uh, the most aggressive, most ambitious climate plan is called Clean BC in British Columbia, which is best not only in uh, Canada, but also North America. Uh, all these projects, including LNG, Site C, any other project, would um, must be uh, within the parameters of uh, Clean BC um, uh, policy that we have developed. So we will continue to work with the experts on that, and we are looking forward to um, um, our, our plan that would increase carbon price rebates for lower and middle uh, income families, rebates for electric vehicles and home efficiency upgrades, um, regulating big polluters to reduce pollution and directing the carbon tax they pay to clean our op um, operations. And so that's what we are doing, and we are gonna uh, make sure that our government continues to um, uh, push for uh, clean energy in British Columbia and also to meet the parameters, the uh, conditions outlined in Clean BC. Great. Thank you, Raj. Uh, can we hear from Tariq Ma Malik with the Liberal Party, please? Can you, can you hear me? Hi there. Yep. Yes. Can't see you. I'm so you. I'm so glad that someone asked that question, see. and uh, I will try to answer my best. Climate change, it's it's it should be everybody's concern, and it's not a government problem. That, it's not a government problem. That's the way I look at it. I think it is. We are all responsible. We're all in this thing together. This is our daily lifestyle, and how we can contribute to make it better for our environment. It's uh, the responsibility lies on you and I, I think this is the thing that we need to work every day basis. What am I doing? What are you doing for, for to contribute to our climate change? Um, you know, uh, the liberal government, we have been pioneer to when it comes to uh, uh, building infrastructures and clean energy, and we are continuing to do, doing further. MLA, I will be pushing this thing forward to further advance for the clean energy by introducing, um, you know, more as our party has already uh, implemented that more charging stations will be available. We are already cut down PST so people can buy more electric vehicles. And uh, there are other further infrastructure that will be uh, in place. So as an elected, elected MLA, I, this will be my priority to push these things forward and work and we can make this happen. Thank you so much. Great, thank you. And last we have uh, Noreen, if you could just quickly answer that question. We're pretty well out of time. So I'll give you like a minute and then I will close the meeting. Thank you. Thanks, Antonia. I'm not gonna need a whole lot of time on this one. BC Greens are pretty clear. We are going to shut down site C. It is going to be both fiscally and structurally unsafe for the people of BC. It is not a project that should be continuing forward. Um, we should not be destroying our natural resources for the benefits of shareholders' profits or massive corporations. We also have committed to moving all um, oil and gas subsidies over to um, green, uh, green innovations, clean technology, um, implementing things like electric vehicles, charging stations, and um, more 
a better rebate program for electric vehicles. These types of things um, are central to the Green Party's beliefs, and we will do everything in our power to protect all of uh, the land that we share, all of the land that we will be passing on to future generations. Thank you. Oh, sorry, I didn't unmute myself. <laughs> okay, so I was just saying that um, thank you everybody for joining us um, this evening. It, I think it was a, a great uh, discussion and we touched upon many different issues. I, I recognize we didn't get to everybody's questions. And for this reason, I encourage you to reach out to your candidates and um, with the phone numbers that we provided um, earlier. And we can put that again on the screen. Uh, and um, encourage everybody to get out and vote. I know that the early voting has started and uh, voting will happen on Saturday. Again, uh, thank you for participating and uh, have a great evening. Thank you. <laughs>